Rabbi Zupan. Rabbi okay. Zupan will start us off with our presentation. So, hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and if you're watching this, not live, you're watching the recording. Thank you for watching. Um, so we are recording. I believe also there's a way that you can turn on captions for yourself, if that would be helpful to you. So if you would like to turn the captions on, um, please find in your own Zoom taskbar uh, the way to enable those captions. They're on. Um, so Joseph and I had an incredible experience this past summer traveling to Poland. And we're so grateful for this opportunity to share a little bit of that experience with you and to reflect on it with you. And um, I, I'm going to guess that among those of you who are on with us this evening, some of you have also had the experience of a Jewish heritage tour in Eastern Europe, and maybe also even in specifically in Poland, like we were. So um, I think that this presentation um, might bring up some of those memories and experiences and reflections you also have. Um, so we traveled to Poland. We were there for just a little over a week. What was very special about our trip, some of you know, is that we traveled with a group of primarily public school educators from the state of North Carolina. The trip had been organized by a rabbi in North Carolina who does a lot of work in Holocaust education and had relationships uh, with uh, some of the educators. And so there was a group of, we were Joseph, 20 plus teachers, I think. Um, and the two of us got to um, tag along as the rabbi's guests. Um, and also there were a couple other Jewish professionals, including another rabbi on the trip. Uh, it was a wonderful way to experience something that was difficult to experience, right? It wasn't, it wasn't quite a vacation. I wouldn't call it a vacation. Um, but it was an incredibly thought-provoking, emotional, and educational uh, experience. So why Poland? So I didn't, I didn't know all of this beforehand. I learned it, and I'll share with you, that before the Holocaust, before the Shoah, Poland's population was more than 10% Jewish. There were over... 3.3 million Jews residing in Poland before the Holocaust. It was the country with the most Jews out of anywhere in the world. Most of the Jews in the world, or, or I should say more Jews, not most of the Jews, but more Jews lived in Poland than lived in any other country. Um, and Jews had lived in Poland for over 1,000 years. So there was this incredibly uh, rich Jewish history in Poland um, of Jewish communities living alongside their Polish Catholic neighbors and um, Jewish families intermingling with their Polish Catholic neighbors. Um, so it made a lot of sense that Poland was the place that we visited. Um, so, Specifically, uh, we'll look a little bit at our trip to Warsaw. Warsaw as a city before the Holocaust was about one third Jewish residents. Um, and uh, Joseph, I'll pass it to you. We uh, were, um, um, we're going to divide this presentation up into several parts and we're gonna pause after each of the parts to look at the chat to be able to take your questions, but one of the places we went was in Warsaw, and we met Rabbi Michael Shudrick, who's the chief rabbi of Poland. He was born in the United States, but he's um, moved to Poland. And here you can see that we are gathered at a synagogue in Poland. And he asked us, uh, he said some, some remarks that really stuck with us. And I invite you to think of those as a frame for the images that you're going to see. Um, which is how do we choose to remember? And he said, you know, basically that nations are not good at acknowledging the nasty stuff they have done. 
and none, no nation is, and Poland is no different. And of course, then I began thinking about the United States, but how we choose to remember, some people choose, and I'm just doing in the order in which he presented it, some people choose to, they're going to re tell the history, but they're going to do revisionist history. They're going to revise the history. And in Poland, that has to do a great deal with, it was all the Nazis, it wasn't the Poles, right? They warp history and say, you know, we were, we were the fighters against the Nazis. We were the heroes. They were the villains. Uh, we certainly weren't collaborators, which is, of course, incredibly false. Um, some people just don't want to talk about it and have a thick wall of denial. Uh, and other people are willing to confront their own history or the history of their country, the history of their forebears, or perhaps maybe better, a better word than confront is encounter their history. To really openly, honestly, vulnerably encounter their history and let's learn from it. So it's much easier to revise or deny. It's much harder to confront, but in many ways, it's much more liberating to confront or encounter the history. So we have divided these pictures that I took mostly with my phone and Julie took with her phone. This is the iPhone version of this into four, um, four sections for this next hour, uh, memorials, camps, anti-Semitism, and heroes. So that's going to be our presentation. And after memorials, we'll pause and look at your questions and so forth. So be sure to type those into the chat. I want to also say right from the start, which is that many of the images that you see are going to be upsetting. There is no way to visit and learn about the Holocaust and visit concentration camps and not see deeply upsetting uh, images. I'm still processing those images now in April. So I say that right from the start. Um, this, is, uh, this is heartbreaking stuff we're about to see. So first, memorials. I'm going to turn it to Rabbi Zupan to guide us through this. So I, I want to invite you to think about the different memorials that you have seen and visited. Uh, war memorials, um, as well as Holocaust memorials. Many of us have visited um, the what I think is a profoundly touching memorial in Boston to the Holocaust. Um, so as we traveled in different places in Poland, uh, we encountered different kinds of memorials. So one of the places we visited in Krakow uh, is the Rima Synagogue. Here is the front of the synagogue. It's named after Rabbi Moses Israelis. He wrote a famous legal commentary um, to the commentary on the Shulchan Aruch. Um, Rabbi Moses Israelis was known by the Hebrew acronym Rima, who's called the Rima. Um, and from the time he lived in the 1500s, and from the time of his death until the time of the Holocaust, his grave was a pilgrimage site for Jews. Um, this cemetery that you're seeing a photo of, this Jewish cemetery next to that synagogue, uh, was active until the year 1800. So Jews were being buried in it up until the year 1800. So that by the time of the Holocaust, it wasn't an active ceremony anymore, but it was a place of memory, of memorial. Um, the cemetery itself was destroyed during the Holocaust and only about a dozen tombstones survived the war in their original state. Um, and among them was the tombstone of the Rima, of Rabbi Israelis, which many people interpreted was proof to his uh, special miraculous powers. So after the Holocaust, the, the cemetery was tidy up a bit and the tombstones were sort of reinstalled, um, arranged in straight rows. But the fragments of the many tombstones that had been destroyed, that couldn't be restored, were used to create this memorial site, which some people call a wailing wall. 
So if you look, when you first look, it looks like a stone wall. And then when you look more closely as you all are, you can see the Hebrew writing on the stones. So this wailing wall, this wall of commemoration, um, you can really see it there, um, was one of the sites we visited in Krakow, a memorial to uh, the Jewish community of Krakow. Second memorial site we visited also in Krakow is this plaza. So we learned that this plaza during the Holocaust was inside the Krakow ghetto. And it was from here um, that uh, many, many thousands of Jews were deported to the death camps. This memorial was set up in the year 2005. At the time they were restoring this part of the city and um, so as part of the restoration, they installed this memorial art exhibit. There are 70 chairs. Uh, might be hard to tell from the photo, but each chair is quite large, larger than life, larger than um, you can kind of see the perspective of people next to it. Um, and it's meant to commemorate all of the people um, who died in the Krakow ghetto or were deported to their deaths from the Krakow ghetto. Um, and the chairs are a reference to a description of the deportation events by a Polish pharmacist who ran a pharmacy inside the Krakow ghetto that overlooked this plaza. Um, from Krakow, one of the places we traveled was to Warsaw. And this trip is not in chronological order of what we did. Um, Um, and thank you. So one of the things that was so striking to us in walking around Warsaw was that the parts of the ghetto walls from the Warsaw ghetto remain. So what you're seeing here is um, an image of the wall. Um, I believe, Joseph, you'll have to correct me that where we're standing was out, the way the picture is taken is from outside the ghetto and on the other side of the wall would be inside the ghetto where those apartment right. where those apartment houses are now and so this is uh, the ghetto walls can be seen throughout the city and in places where the walls aren't standing in the pavement i think a little later we'll see a photo of that um here's another image notice the barbed wire on top of the wall um and the wall, you know, weren't that tall. They were 12, 14, 15 feet tall, something like that, with the barbed wire on top, at least in this place. Um, so one of the things that was striking for us being in Warsaw and seeing these ghetto walls were, you know, they're next to city parks and playgrounds and apartment buildings. And we could hear, you know, children and their parents and just sort of like normal civilian happy life. And there we were standing next to the Warsaw ghetto learning about what took, uh, the ghetto walls learning about what took place, um, you know, some years ago. Uh, it was really, it was hard to imagine um, how one lives next to Warsaw ghetto wall. And here I'm um, showing it in the sidewalks where, um, where the wall once stood. But then also it made me think about, I mean, made us think about um, the sort of living memorials that we, and the history that we live among, right? Many of us, you know, we live in, you know, next door to sites of commemoration for the transatlantic slave trade. And, you know, all the more so if you visit, you know, certain cities, I was a tourist in Charleston and we visited a slave market and, and right next door is like a great restaurant with like, you know, cocktails. So like that juxtaposition was something I think we sort of struggled with and as well as our own emotions seeing that. Um, okay, so we've seen um, the ghetto walls, the chairs, um, the wailing wall or the gravestone wall. So here is a fourth memorial sort of more like what we picture, I think, when we think of a war memorial. This is a monument to the ghetto heroes. 
and it commemorates um, the spot on which they believe the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising first started in 1943. Um, and um, this is a closer look at part of that monument. And as the caption says, if you take a, sort of a look at the faces, um, you know, we were really struck by like where the figure's eyes are looking, the child looking backwards, the adults looking forward, the helmets in the background, if you look carefully. Um, and, and Joseph, I don't know if you can use your pointer to point out the, your cursor to point out. Yeah, you could see the helmets there. The bayonets. Um, the bayonets, right. A sort of Moses figure carrying the Torah. At least that's what it looks like to me. Maybe your interpretation is a different one. And there's also this woman here who's looking backwards and this child. So there's a lot going on in this engraving. Right. We wondered, you know, what are they looking at? Is this like Lot's wife looked backwards and turned into a pillar of salt, you know? Um, This was yet another memorial, this to a particular um, person. We think about heroes. So here's a hero from the time of the Holocaust, a Jewish educator um, who was famous as an, as an educator and a writer in Poland, um, Janusz Korszak. Um, he was offered the opportunity to escape um, but he chose to stay and continue to run the orphanages that he had been running. And then when his children were, um, the children he was caring for were evacuated to the gas chambers, again, he made the decision to accompany them and to offer them comfort along the way. Um, a true hero. Um, and this is a memorial that's in the cemetery in Warsaw. We actually had um, one of these very fortuitous, um, serendipitous uh, things happen when we were uh, walking in Warsaw. Um, we came across an archaeological excavation. And when I think of archaeology, yeah, it's a great picture. When I think of archaeology, you know, I think of biblical times. I think of like the ancient world. Um, but this is an excavation of the Warsaw ghetto. And it um, includes the apartment that they've identified as Mila 18. That was the street address um, where the key figures in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising planned the uprising and where they stayed. And they've recovered all sorts of, um, you know, glass bottles and, you know, all sorts of things. And the excavations are continuing. We got to speak with an archaeologist, um, I think she's a master's student, I remember, um, doing some of this research, and um, she gave us an impromptu tour of what they had discovered. Um, we were able to walk up on that platform that you see and sort of look down um, into the different apartments. These are the basements of the apartments that they've uncovered. The apartment buildings themselves were leveled. Um, when the ghetto was destroyed. So they're going underneath the destruction to see what was there. Yeah, Joseph, why don't you um, pick up for this one? All right, so this is actually, so that was next door. And this is actually on the site of Mila 18 and uh, Mordechai and Yulowitz, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, he was the 23 year old leader of the fight. And this is a monument to him. And we said Kaddish, a great deal. We said the memorial prayer to the dead a great deal, and I stayed to say Kaddish for him in this site. So I'm going to um, pause here, um, and let's take a look at um, questions, and maybe, Corey, you can help me out um, and help, uh, uh, help us out. If there's anybody who's written any questions, or do you want a quick type something in now about what you just saw about memorials. We don't have any questions in the chat yet, but while people are thinking and 
perhaps typing, I have a question for you. Yes, please. Uh, you're talking about different ways that people choose to remember. And my favorite way to remember is through music. Did you encounter any music either on your trip in general or at any of these memorials that stayed with you? Um, once that I co immediately comes to mind in Lublin, we learned, uh, I didn't learn the song, but I heard the song and I looked it up. There, there was a yeshiva of students who was, you know, being deported and instead, and while they were being confronted outside, um, they started um, singing a song uh, that basically said, God, um, you know, we, you and I, this is our love affair and these folks don't matter and we're going to outlive them. We're going to um, outlast them which was quite the, uh, it's a famous, um, and I don't, I'm doing this now off the top of my head, but if the yeshiva students of Lublin um, singing in the face of the Nazis was a, a, a profound story that Rabbi Fred Gutman, who was leading our trip, uh, told us. Um, and people still sing that song. It does, it's like, it doesn't sound at first like a Holocaust themed song, but it was used at this time and became associated with it. All right, I'm gonna go to the next part and you know- Before you do, I think someone had a raised hand. If you could put your question in the chat, we can relay it for you. Yeah, thank you, Corey. So I'm gonna continue um, and to camps. And again, I wanna especially stress about upsetting images. Uh, taking photographs of concentration camps is upsetting um, and it still haunts me, but in a, in a way that I feel uh, has helped shaped me um, for the better. So we um, we went to Auschwitz Birkenau, and um, you know, which is a, a, an awe inspiring place to be for all the wrong reasons. Um, here's the famous gate as you approach, and you've seen replicas of it, maybe at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. Um, where it says Arbach Mach Frei, which ironically means work brings freedom. And of course, there was no freedom. Uh, there's many times when um, there are many times when the Nazis would try to um, keep people subdued by giving that by deceiving them into thinking that they are just going to a labor camp. They're not really going to their deaths. You most likely uh, know about showers uh, that masqueraded, uh, that covered for gas chambers. So again, this was, you were going with this, you were going to um, work your way to freedom, but it, um, but that was of course not the case. Uh, the bee is upside down and there's a lot of stories about why is the bee upside down. Rabbi Gottman told us because you were entering an upside down world. Uh, here is the electrified fencing. If you were able to go to the uh, Auschwitz exhibit downtown in Boston, you saw a section of this that's been placed there as part of the exhibit. Some people uh, chose to commit suicide by throwing themselves on the electrified barbed wire fencing um, rather than endure. And here is because the Nazis were, uh, you know, had their own reality. They felt like every place needed music, including Auschwitz, and they made a Jewish band, forced a Jewish band to play uh, music. And this is where the band would play near the entrance. And this was marching music um, and is just gruesome in its irony. Uh, also, the 24th block, uh, which is, and this is an under-researched area of the Holocaust, this was a brothel of Jewish women who were used by the Nazis and uh, sexual uh, violence by the Nazis against Jewish women. There was a, Rabbi Gutman told us a story about once he was leading a trip with a tour guide and somebody was on the trip said, oh, 24 block, before they explained what it was, they said the 24th block, oh, that where my mom said she was kept. And they had to take that person aside and explain what this was. And of course, just wreck them because she never told him 
what was what the 24th block in Auschwitz really meant. Um, here are women's barracks. You can see that people were uh, just closely packed in here. And uh, there are uh, a lot of collections of shoes at this. Here are adult shoes. They're gray because of the preservative they put on them, um, but there are adult shoes, but there's also children's shoes. And so these are children's size shoes. And what is incredibly um, haunting is that it's difficult to find a matching pair. So that means that it's not like half of these shoes, it's double these shoes as to trying to get to the scale of what this is indicating and symbolizing. Uh, and I sometimes don't try to um, wrap my mind around 6 million Jews murdered. I try to focus on one pair of shoes. Like for instance, look at this matching pair of shoes that are right here or these pair of sandals. And I try to imagine the person who walked in those shoes. Um, there's also was luggage there. And again, one of the deceptions is that they would say, please put your name on the luggage so that you can collect it later. And it was a way of keeping people cooperative. Um, but of course they were never coming back for their luggage. Uh, there is gallows that are there. Some of you may remember the scene in the novel Night where Elie Wiesel sees the execution of a child and someone says, where is God? And another person says, there is God up on the gallows. That scene from night, well, these are the gallows that Wiesel was referring to. Um, the second part, Auschwitz II, is also called Birkenau. You can see the railroad tracks into this area. And we arrive, you can now see from the other, if you come through those tracks, we have now arrived where the infamous Dr. Mengele stood and if he, and you can see a cattle car here, and that's where we are standing. And it is surreal to be standing in a place where if you got sent to the right, that was to immediate death. And if you got sent to the left, that was to dehumanizing labor and torture and then eventual death. So this is an original cattle car, um, held about a hundred people. And there is actually, we were told that there's a, a pair of tefillin that were put in there and that's kept in there. Rabbi Zupan, did you want to jump in for anything? Just because I'm talking a lot. No, okay. Um, so if you walk around, I so now I'm doing this, you have to walk all the way around, but I'm doing it in the order in which somebody would have encountered the gas chambers. And we stood here and the, the Nazis tried to cover up their crimes, so they bombed the gas chambers. They blew up the gas chambers so that to try to cover their crimes. Of course they couldn't. Um, we heard the, the story of a rabbi, Laszlo Berkowitz, who is um, a survivor and his mother, she died here. And he stood, when he went on a trip, he was in um, Falls Church, Virginia, as rabbi, reformer rabbi in Falls Church, Virginia. But when he was on a trip with Rabbi Gutman, he stood here at the entrance to where you would go into the gas chambers complex and he said, you know, this is the last place my mother saw the sky. And he sang El Malay Rachamim, um, which is a memorial prayer. And we sang El Malay Rachamim in Kaddish here. And we said El Malay Rachamim in Kaddish here. And uh, this is, um, maybe you have seen um, a model of this at the Holocaust Memorial Museum, like a clay white model. Uh, this is the actual place. And they would go into this place, and this was the undressing room. And again, to deceive people, they would give you a string to tie your shoes together to say, keep them together so that you can find them more easily when you come back. But of course, they weren't coming back. So it was another deception to keep them cooperative and docile. Uh, this is the ruins of the gas chamber itself. Uh, again, this was all bombed by the Nazis. And this is the ruins of the crematorium. And then in one of the ironies that I find, because when I see green growing things, I find that, um, you know, soothing and healing and inspiring. But this is one of the ponds where people's ashes were dumped. And I just, I have a hard time understanding like what I'm seeing in front of me. We went to Auschwitz-Birkenau. We also went to Treblinka. 
Um, Treblinka was completely destroyed by the Nazis and they employed farmers to plow it over. So it was completely leveled. So there is nothing left of Treblinka. The Soviets came in and put in memorials. So what you're seeing here is basically going to be an empty field and Soviet memorials. That's all that's left of Treblinka. Um, they engaged in deception. Uh, they, this is where you can see where the railroad tracks were. They put up a fake Red Cross station as if there was going to be a, a first aid station. They put up signs going as if trains were going, taking people both ways. The trains only took people one way. There were flower pots. So they made it again so that people would docile, cooperatively get off the train and do as they were told. Uh, so this is the plowed field that was Treblinka that the Soviets have erected this memorial over. The Soviets like big, like big stony, gray, ugly blocks of things. That's what they do. Uh, it's um, and here is a whole bunch of stones, and each one had a name of a community engraved upon it. If you go forward and walk around this big monolith, you get to. They did not have um, a crematoria in. Um, in Treblinka, they had an open mass grave where they burned people. And here's this stone memorial that they've put into where the mass grave was. Truly haunting is these things. These things are vents for gas because of the bodies were decomposing and letting out gas in order to vent the ground they put in these vents. It's hard for me even to say these things out loud because it's so surreal and, and evil. Um, but just because something is unimaginable doesn't mean it didn't really happen or it, and it's not true. Um, we went out into the woods, not just camps, but also mass graves in the forests where people were shot. We brought went to a, a town called Tikochin and there are three mass graves there. And you can see where people have come and hung Israeli flags. There's a memorial with a Star of David on it. Um, and again, that's fenced off so that nobody walks on that ground. We heard gruesome stories of what SS officers did to people there. Um, this is the second mass grave of Tikochin. And this is the third. Um, it was very quiet and birds were chirping. And we are trying to, again, take in the, the irony of the beauty of nature and then trying to figure out the reality of what we were witnessing and where we were. There is Julie spotted and took this picture of this tiny card that someone tied to that the green railing around it. Not six million Jews were murdered, but only one Jew and this happened six million times. I'm sorry, I, I'm getting emotional as I'm presenting. It's very hard to relive this trip uh, with you. Um, and now I'm getting to the hardest part, actually. So um, the third, the third camp we visited was Majdanek. And unlike the other camps that the Nazis destroyed, um, they didn't destroy Majdanek. So it's really left almost as is. And therefore, it has a great deal of artifacts. And we learned a lot about the Holocaust from this because it's intact. It has been obviously adjusted for people to be able to come and visit. And, you know, there's sidewalks and restrooms and things like that. But um, it's shocking as is. And th these pictures are really uh, disturbing. Um, and you know, remember, you don't have to stay on. <laughs> this is if you reach your limit, you can sign off and and step away or take a break and watch the recording later or something. I just want self care in watching this sort of thing is important. Um, when, as you walk up the road to enter Maidana concentration camp, this is the commandant's house. Uh, this is where he lived with his family. He lived right outside of the camp and then he would walk up and go to work every day. And there used to be a swing set outside that you could see. And so somehow he lived right next to this with his family and his work was a death camp. 
And so here we are now walking up to where the road, le uh, where the railroad tracks used to be to enter Maidanek. And you can see everything is left as is. Nothing here was bombed or destroyed. Um, and I, um, we, as we, we just came in from here, and then we make, uh, this is if you walk in and make a U-turn, you turn back to one of Maidanek's gas chambers. And this is the entrance to the gas chamber. Um, and this is then you walk in, and this is where they shaved people's hair. And this was an actual disinfecting bath, and there was disinfection because some people went immediately to death and some people were sent for labor. So there was a selection process. So this was a disinfecting bath, if you call this concrete thing a bath. And these were actual showers. These were real showers for disinfection. And then there is a storage room for Zyklon B containers. So these were the pellets that were used to create the lethal gas that killed people. And they're just stored there. And there are two gas chambers side by side. And here's a door to the gas chamber. And you can see there's a, a peephole to be able to look to see what was happening inside. And this is the inside of a gas chamber. And this is the second gas chamber. You can see the door. And I couldn't help but feel like, you know, people were banging on that door, right? This was, there's a space in between the gas chambers where they would attach, where I didn't, I didn't show that picture where they attach the gas um, containers. And this is what I'm gonna show you is an up close look inside the second gas chamber. You can see the blue stains are from the poison gas. It's a very hard thing to see. Um, we stepped out and there are a number of warehouses along up from this gas chamber. And here's a collection of shoes. Again, they're great from preservatives. I think, Julie, isn't the Holocaust Memorial Museum's collection of shoes taken from this exhibit? I think if I'm remembering correctly, that's right. Um, but there's so many shoes, so many shoes, shoes and more shoes and then more shoes. And I took off my shoes, so there's my ugly black sneakers that I always wear. Um, I took them off because I just felt like it could have been me. It could have been me. And I was taking a picture of my shoes next to their shoes. Um, again, Julie talked about, um, you know, people walking around the Warsaw ghetto wall and living next to a Warsaw ghetto wall. Well, this is, I just walked to the fence of Maidanek and here people are living right next to Maidanek. Um, I don't know, maybe real estate prices are lower. If you live next to a death camp, there's gardens, there's swing sets, there's people outside, children are running around and they live right next door. If you go, this is me inside my donic looking through the fence with barbed wire, if you look up here, with the original fence post and there's somebody's yard. And I just don't know how anybody lives right next door to a death camp with beautiful beautiful homes and gardens and kids. I don't understand it. We walked up and Julie and I could smell something burning. And we said, well, it can't have been it can't it can't have been the the Holocaust, right? Because it's too long ago. Um, and the answer is yes, you can actually still smell it. And that's the thing that haunts me the most from our trip is the smell of Maidanek. We walked up, there's the crematorium, as is. Uh, here's the dissection table for looting gold teeth and so on. There was also a, a, a room that just looked like a plain concrete room where they shot people. 
Here is the ovens of, of Maidonic. Um, and then we walked outside and this is where I, I kind of lost it right here. Uh, cause this garden is kept up because it was original to Maidonic. Uh, they wanted to make Maidonic a more pleasant place to work for the Nazis. And so while the Nazis were performing these inhuman acts, these cruel, evil acts, they also had them, you know, make sure that they could have a break and you know, go out for a cigarette next to the flowers or something. So here are these this rose garden that is kept up just to show what the Nazis were like, that they had this garden. There are also sculptures. I mean, things like it's just bizarro land, you know, the opposite of anything normal. There is a mass grave, a huge mass grave in Maidanek. Um, Operation Harvest Festival what killed tens of thousands of people. Um, and that's, we heard the story about a woman who fell into the grave, but then was later pulled out by the Soviets and survived. Um, and then you can see, if you turn around, you can see the crematorium is on your left. And then there's this memorial on your right, which is this dome. And this is, was to me the hardest thing to, to comprehend. Because when you walk up, uh, what you're seeing here, preserved here under this dome, is a three-story deep or high um, mountain of human ash. And that's what we could smell. That's what we were smelling. When we were smelling the burnt smell, that's because there's this massive, there were 15 ash heaps at Maidanek, and they for memorial purposes, collected them all together and put them under the stone and put some kind of coating or something on top of it to keep it from blowing away. But just for perspective, you see the people, I, I chose a picture with the people in the background. This is a three story mountain of human ash. And because I could smell it, I felt like there was a part of it that got in me. Right. Like I smelt it. So I inhaled it. So it was in me and it's still in me. Like it's what what I have this this smell and this ash, the remnants of that in me from my donic now. And I'm carrying it around with me. It's it's incomprehensible, but there it is. We have to comprehend it because it was real. And then you look across. And somehow through the barbed wire, there's this sunlit city of living, breathing Maidanic of people going about their business, people, farmers, everybody else. I'm gonna pause here, um, just in case anybody wants to ask a question in the chat. It's okay to not ask a question. It's a lot to absorb this trip. And we, we had days to absorb it and we're giving it to you in an hour. Yeah, I think we might all be feeling numb. That's right. Me too. I'll throw you another question while people are processing and feeling numb and all of the things. Was there anything that you saw that you were so absorbed in that you didn't take a picture? Oh. I don't know. I took pictures um, wherever I could because I kind of, honestly, I was taking pictures for all of you. I was really feeling like I was coming to document this because I'm on sabbatical to study and to bring something back to my congregation. And I really wanted to... Um, be your ambassador and bring this to you. Um, so I tried to take pictures of everything uh, that I could. But you know what you don't get in pictures are the conversations with people. And so that's harder to relay. One of the um, you know aspects of the trip being so that educators from most of them are from North Carolina um, are folks who teach 
either literature or um, history, whether American or European, um, um, who teach the Holocaust in some way. So maybe they teach the book night or, you know, in different contexts in their schools, uh, middle school and high school. And so they were, some of them had a lot of knowledge of the Holocaust. Um, they had been to other seminars um, and they were very immersed. And some were, this was sort of brand new to them. This was an opportunity for professional development and a little bit of travel. Um, and they all were very serious minded, but um, you know, they had different levels of knowledge coming in. Uh, some of the, uh, one of the teachers was, is Jewish, another one's part of a Jewish family. Um, some of the others knew a lot about Judaism. Most of them knew really nothing about Judaism. Um, and we had a lot of conversations sort of processing it together and where, you know, Joseph's really the photographer between the two of us but where we were sort of um, wanted to make a recording so that, you know, what we were experiencing to share with you and with others, they were taking photos and collecting materials so that they could, you know, create their and enhance their lesson plans and bring this to their students, a lot of them. And so it was sort of a weird, um, uncomfortable feeling, I think, for all of us of, wanting to experience this and let the emotions watch wash over us and you know process it together just as adults and not feel like we're there for any other ulterior motive like we're getting some benefit out of this because oh this is going to make a great lesson you know for my eighth graders like that weird sort of feeling I think we felt that tension I think all of us on the trip felt that tension often um, and, um, and I know that, you know, we, we sort of grew with the intensity of the experience. We sort of felt close to a lot of people on the trip in that short amount of time. Most of them didn't know each other before the trip. Some knew each other, but most didn't. Um, so we wanted to take the photos and we were also very aware that we're not tourists. Right. You know, like that, that's the tension, part of the um, tension. Let's, um, honey, let's go to anti-Semitism and heroes, and then let's circle back for the rest of the questions, I think. Yeah, so um, so I'll pick up here. So, you know, one of the, um, one of the things that we talked about was, you know, why Poland? Why was Poland the site of six of the Nazi death camps? And there's lot, lots of political reasons for that. Um, I remember learning, you know, growing up that it was because there was already a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland and that, um, you know, the Polish people weren't going to fight too hard on behalf of their Jews. Um, I think there's truth to that, but we also learn that there's sort of the political elements um, that, you know, Germany, um, Nazi Germany, viewed the Poles um, as, you know, second class to Aryan Germans. And so there was an element of putting like the dirtiest, the dirtiest part of um, the destruction on Polish soil. So there were six extermination camps, six death camps in Poland. So we visited three of them. So, um, so Poland today, um, and thinking back to those like three options that were laid out of like revisionism of the history, um, encountering or confronting the history or denying, you know, it wasn't that bad or that didn't really happen, those three things. So here we were in Krakow. This was probably like our first day, I think, first or second day. So this is um, a marketplace. Krakow is a beautiful city. It was not destroyed during the Holocaust. So it's it looks like a beautiful European city, um, lots of beautiful history and buildings, and there's a palace. Um, so here's a market in Krakow. 
Um, actually, if you'll just go back for another second. Mm. The market in Krakow um, was a, it was part of a Jewish neighborhood. Um, Krakow had a big Jewish community, um, part of a Jewish neighborhood. Um, we saw a site where the kosher butcher used to be. Um, and this was a marketplace. And the fast food here, I would describe as like street food. So it's very much a tourist spot today um, with, you can see like vendors selling, you know, inexpensive clothing. And then now, Joseph, if you'll go to the next slide for us. Um, so among the things for sale are mementos. So um, these were some of the mementos. These are not authentic artifacts. Like on our trip, some of our first instinct was like, wait, what? What, they have these things here? Like we should be at a museum. And then we were quickly told like, no, 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 these are all like fakes, they're mementos. So like you go to Paris and maybe you buy like a little mini Eiffel Tower as a souvenir, or you go to London and you get like a little double-decker toy bus. Um, these were things that were on sale in Krakow for tourists, uh, mementos of the Holocaust. Um, so thinking about revisionism, one of the things that we noticed across Poland and here in Krakow is a great example of it. This is a sign uh, on what this wall that we're looking at was a wall of the uh, Krakow ghetto, Jewish ghetto in Krakow. And this is a sign commemorating, acknowledging that that is the Krakow wall. And the sign um, says uh, in, uh, you see it says in Hebrew and in Polish, um, that, that this is a site where the Jewish people were persecuted at the hands of Hitler. Um, so over and over again, we saw that the Poles um, were, or Polish, I shouldn't say the Poles, the Polish sites that we saw were quick to acknowledge that the Nazis did these terrible things. Um, but it was always, you know, the Nazis, the Germans. So like no acknowledgement of any local role. Um, uh, in uh, what happened to Jews and others. So this is in the, you know, the old Krakow city, um, sort of beautiful historic part, lots of tourists from all over the world. We walked around and heard lots of different languages being spoken. The old town of Krakow in this marketplace and for sale in the marketplace in the tourist shops, you could buy a little jewelry. You could also buy these sort of good luck statues these are statues of uh, money lending Jews with coins and money bags. I took a lot of pictures of these. I had heard before we went on our trip that this was a popular item for sale. And then we learned um, from our Polish tour guide that there is a saying in Poland, uh, in Polish, that says, you know, let's be, friend be friends in life, but Jews in business. And so the insidiousness of anti-Semitism, right? It just like, it runs deep. This, we felt like this was just one example of um, how anti-Semitism is part of a culture. Something that really surprised us when we were at Auschwitz, we were waiting outside like the main museum part to enter it was very hot. We were like trying to find a shady spot to wait to enter. And there's a bookstore at Auschwitz um, and they sell um, souvenirs and including refrigerator magnets. And um, so you can get your refrigerator magnet of Auschwitz. And that um, Joseph wrote, would you like one in black and white or in color? Um, and it was just um, shocking to us like, who puts an Auschwitz magnet on their fridge? Like, who was the market for this? Just felt um, unholy, like worse than inappropriate. Um, so those were just some of the examples. Uh, when we look to heroes, you know, to us, I think the heroes, uh, among the heroes, certainly there were heroes at the time, but there are heroes doing important work today in Poland. Um, and um, I'll share, we'll share a couple of ways. So we visited the JCC in Krakow, which is really an incredible community center. Um, I don't know when it was uh, created. I didn't look that up. But um, since we're in Ukraine, they and the mass um, refugees who've come into Poland, because Poland shares a border with Ukraine, 
the JCC has um, stepped up to serve the Ukrainian refugees in really incredible ways. Um, to date, they have um, provided social services to over 200,000 Ukrainian refugees, um, providing shelter, uh, food, trauma services. Um, and one of the amazing things about that is that most of those Ukrainian refugees are not Jewish, um, but the JCC in Krakow very much sees as its mission um, to help people in need. There is a Shoah, a Holocaust lens to it, right? Like how the world would have been different. How many of our family histories would have been different if there had been people like the people at the JCC in Krakow who had stepped up in the 1940s? Help us. Um, there's also an element, if you remember from the early years of, you know, two years ago, the news that um, Ukrainian men of fighting age are not permitted to leave Ukraine. So refugees are primarily um, women and children, the elderly, and so um, they're people who need extra support. Um, so we met this incredible man, the man on the right, he's incredible too. He was then, he um, Jonathan Ornstein, he uh, just recently stepped down, been the CEO of the Krakow and JCC and it's really um, due to his efforts that they've done such tremendous work for Ukrainian refugees. Um, and then this man on the left um, is a Holocaust survivor, 94 years old. Maybe he's 95 now. His name is Bernard. He happened to drop by while our group was being welcomed by Jonathan Ornstein and hearing about the work of the JCC. Um, and, uh, and so we got to ask him, you know, questions about his experience. And um, it was it was just incredible to hear he's someone who's a volunteer at the Krakow JCC now with all of these refugees. The other incredible thing, um, if you'll just go back one more. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, I know we're at time. Um, the JCC in Krakow uh, has a fundraising bike race, right? You've heard of these things. Um, and it goes uh, from, I forget which camp, it goes from, one from Auschwitz camps. to Krakow. Auschwitz to Krakow. I don't know how many miles it is. It's a lot of miles. And um, Jonathan and Bernard uh, ride a two-person bike um, in the race, and they've done that each year. So it was just an incredible story. And now I, I, I'm watching the clock. If we'll go to the next slide, thinking about Encounter, we met. Um, the two women on the right in this picture um, are uh, run a program. Um, they're invited into Poland, Polish high schools, and they run an, basically an encounter program um, to help the teenagers learn about the Holocaust. Um, and so they're not invited to every school, but those schools that welcome them, they run this um, program teaching the teenagers, the truth about what happened in Poland and the teenagers under their guidance actually research the fate of the Jews in their town. Um, so that was just incredible. We um, you know, spoke to them through a translator and it was really just amazing. Um, and then if you, if you have visited Poland, you've probably been to this museum. It's called Poland. It's a Polish Jewish history museum. And it was just um, incredible to learn more about this a thousand year history of Jews in Poland, um, which was something I, I was not really aware of, even though my own, my own Jewish ancestors come from Krakow, among other places. Um, and so this is just, um, you know, we saw this replica of um, a synagogue interior. You know, this is, we learned a lot about that. Um, and uh, Joseph, do you, um, do, you, mm. do you want to pick up? I can continue. Sure. To... Next near there is also the Jewish archives. And they're known as, and many people might know this already, but they're called the Oneg Shabbos archives because when, Warsaw was ghettoized, um, people said, you know, we have to document this. And so it's just pretending as if we're just getting together for Shabbat afternoon for an Oneg 
And what they were really doing was documenting, documenting, documenting everything that the Nazis were doing and everything they could about Jewish life. And so this is um, the, the uh, archives, the Jewish archives, and they stored a lot of documents in milk canisters and they buried them. Um, and so you saw like these, these kind of milk containers and inside those would be documents and other things. Something that was really important to me that I had them take me directly there um, was this, this is, um, I knew that the writings of the Piazetsna Rebbe were found here. We spent, those of us spent once a summer, I taught a summer on the Piazetsna Rebbe and his writings during the Holocaust, the Warsaw Ghetto Rabbi. And the only reason we know so much about him is because he knew he was not going to survive but he buried his sermons and his writings and his in these milk canisters and buried them and they were found after his death. Um, and so here's a hand, handwritten um, Devar Torah by the Piazetsna Rebbe. Um, um, I'll, I'll jump in I, here. Please take this. Um, so one of the, um, you know, sort of one of the incredible things also about the Owning Shabbos archives, that whole center, you know, is a center of scholarship and there are, you know, a lot of people with no, you know, family connection uh, to Jewish families who are, you know, getting their masters, like the woman doing the archaeological research we met, you know, she's not Jewish, um, she's Polish. Um, so I think though, I think of those people as heroes too, they're, they're truth tellers. So um, some of you may have heard of the city of Kilcha, I'm probably mispronouncing it, Joseph. Um, so this is a small city in Poland um, where I first learned about it is that in 1946, so post Holocaust, when um, some of the Jews who had survived the Holocaust were gathering young Jews, people, teenagers, people in their 20s, um, they were you know, finding each other and gathering and figuring out what their next step were. And there was sort of a communal house where some of them gathered. And in this city, there was a site of a um, after the Holocaust, where um, a local mob came in and um, the story is written here, but there was a blood libel. They accused the Jews of kidnapping this Christian boy. Um, and there was this pogrom where many Jews after the Holocaust was killed. And that event is a known event in Polish history and in Jewish history. Um, and many people say that that event was the catalyst um, for so many Jews who, those who survived the Holocaust to flee Poland. It was a major event. There's a lot of denial around, you know, what actually happened. So this man we met, um, Bogdan um, Bialik, is a Catholic Polish man, a uh, peace activist, and he founded this center to publicize the truth and to run encounter programs. And he started an annual commemoration. Um, where uh, they visit the graves of those who were killed in the pogrom where their bodies were buried. Um, and so we got to visit a memorial, that site, um, which was uh, just incredibly moving. And so this gentleman is uh, one of the heroes we met. And here in that same cemetery, there's a mass grave of Jewish children. Um, and... There is a, um, you know, the, there was a custom that when you visit graves in Jewish cemeteries, um, you put stones on to say you were there, maybe to put down some of the burden symbolically onto the grave, um, that their souls and the earth should be weighed down by the stones so that they don't wander, all sorts of symbolism. But somewhere along the line at this mass grave of children, first of all, even saying the words mass grave of children is, is hard to put together in one sentence. But they started putting toys down instead. And so this is a mass grave of children in Kilcha. Um, and people started putting down toys instead of stones. Um, and this is um, and this is the last picture that we're going to show you. This is, if I were to talk about heroes, I would talk about uh, you know, the majority of um 
these folks are really there to be able to teach the Shoah properly. And so here we are the, in the, minor, Jews, the Jewish minority of this trip. Overwhelmingly, these are Christian um, high school teachers from North Carolina who are having this encounter in Poland with Rabbi Fred Gutman right here in the middle. Here is Rabbi Zupan. Um, and you can see that um, they're all coming with their, um, I, they didn't have any accents. We had a Northern accent. They had no accent. No, they had strong Southern accents and um, really trying to come back. And we met some of us incredible human beings and they want to sometimes under really adverse circumstances in North Carolina, teach about the Holocaust. And so I see them as heroes too. I'll add that, um, the um, just xing out of these pictures, um, these, you know, but it was mixed. There was always mixed things. There was miscommunications. There was, you know, it's a struggle to try to understand what really happened and and to process it. Um, I'll add that, you know, speaking of the difficulty in teaching the Holocaust, teaching the Shoah in the United States. I learned at a staff meeting uh, two weeks ago that, um, you know, we teach in seventh grade at Temple Sinai, we've been teaching the Holocaust through Mouse, through the graphic novel Mouse. And it turns out we could get all the copies of Mouse that we want for very little, for a buck a piece. And that's because in the Midwest, they are emptying their libraries of Mouse. They are not teaching Mouse and it's being banned from public schools and libraries. Uh, and so that's why Temple Sinai can get so many plentiful copies of this book um, because of what's happening with um, education and anti-Semitism, among the many other things that are happening in the United States. So that's deeply, deeply disturbing. Um, and I want to um, I want to have us stop here. It's 8.09. Maybe we can just take the next five minutes and we'll end at 8.15. Um, to get to your questions in the chat. So, Corey, do you have anything you want to pull out from the questions that we didn't answer already? I do. Uh, a few people were asking about um, the people who lived outside the camps. Were people who lived outside of the camp questioned after the war? And did you get to speak with any of the current residents living in the area? Uh, we didn't speak to current residents. Um, I don't know the answer to that. If they were questioned after the war, maybe. Um, you know, the people who are living there now aren't necessarily the same people who are living there then. There was one place we visited, Joseph, I don't remember which one, um, where we saw, I think it was Auschwitz-Birkenau, we saw some like protest signs and we didn't know what that was about. You know, it's in Polish. And we asked um, our tour guide, and he said that there were people whose property was taken in eminent domain, like their property was taken to build the camps, and they're trying to get more money from the government for it. Um, right. So that was fascinating. Um, and Joseph, did you think of this when you visited the Nova Festival? Um, um, I sure I did. I went, I you know, went on a JNF uh, USA mission, and when we visited the, when I visited the Nova Music Site Festival, it felt like I was visiting Kilche, but it hadn't. But the Greek, uh, 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 like the Tikochin, where the mass graves were in the woods, but the ground had, but there the grass had grown back, and this was it was like visiting Tikochin before the grass had grown back. It was uh, Nova. The Nova Music Festival site felt like the site of, a, a, it was the site of a pogrom. Um, but but even worse, in fact, I was talking to an Israeli father of one of our preschoolers today, and it says like, what happened at Nova was worse than the kitchen of pogrom. Like it's, I just feel that that's, that's true. Mm. Um, there are some questions about whether, you know, what kind of education Polish youth teens receive today regarding the Holocaust if they you know visit the camps and so on 
I don't actually know the answers to that, but I know either. when we were there, uh, Poland was in the midst of a national election campaign. Um, and, um, and the, I don't, I think he didn't win, but, um, you know, the the one who was leading in the polls at the time was, you know, Holocaust revisionist and, you know, really wanted to say po this was something imposed from entirely from the outside. Right. So there I, was, you know, was it is it going to be the um, like the the teachers, like those high school teachers that I, we featured in the picture or the tour, the Polish educators who were working at the archives? or our tour guide through Auschwitz was clearly a revisionist, right? It was definitely yeah. all about the Polish heroes who fought the Nazis and defended their Jewish neighbors. And it's all BS. Um, and Rabbi Gutman, who was, was like really aggravated yeah. and want to get it as far away from her as possible. Uh, but then you can't walk through Auschwitz anymore without a one of their guides to show you through with a, a minder. And uh, and I feel that that's propag Polish propaganda and revisionism. Yeah. And I'll also add that even if the stories of some Polish heroes are true, like those stories are true, um, there is revisionism in which stories you, one chooses to uplift and highlight. Right. Um, we need to end. So thank you all for your attention. And I know I'm going to be available afterwards, um, you know, in days and weeks to come if you want to email me privately or set up a time to talk. But um, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. And Corey, you can stop the recording. Thank you.